repeating it and these are principles these are the principles which are highlighted in the volume 1 so you have part 1 part 2 part 3 and then you have the two parts other parts which is 4 and 4b which are the independent standards friends as you would be aware that independence is a very very important part of our uh, day to day practice where we have to uh, be independent uh, in more ways than one and so the these are the independent standards for part 4a what we have so within volume 1 we have a part 4a where the independence for audits and related reviews are covered and then we have a four part 4b where the independence requirements for other assurance uh, engagements are covered so these are typically the five parts under volume 1 uh, part 1 2 3 4a and 4b and then you have a glossary for all the professional accountants uh, uh, where some of the important terms are defined uh, under that so you can go to the next slide uh, yeah right so uh, friends like i said the 2009 code got revised in 2019 some of the important changes and uh, you can see uh, some of the changes though the uh, code of ethics was made applicable from 1st july 2020 and thereafter some of the provisions uh, were deferred and finally they were i would say they were again deferred they were deferred on a couple of uh, times and finally they were implemented they have now been implemented from 1st of october 2022 very recently uh, 2000 september 2020 i think 28 september the announcement was made about their applicability which it went from 1st of october 2022 so these three provisions uh, there has been some tweaking done with respect to what the original provisions were and what the final the what has been announced by the council they are with respect to no clar restrictions on the taxation service to audit clients and also uh, safeguards on fees from a uh, single client you know what is the portion proportion of fees that a professional accountant you get from a single client so that is another provision which originally was deferred and now it has been made applicable from 1st of october 2022 and then there are a couple of other uh, substantive changes that have been made from the previous code uh, moving on to the next slide who is a professional accountant because you know when you go through the code you will find this terminology used very extensively professional accountant so isba code also defines uh, uses the term professional accountant but in our code the indian version so you know we have convert so it's not a copy paste that uh, we have done but we have uh, so it's not a full adoption of the isba code that we have done in india but it is a conversion so you know we have tweaked it to suit some of the regulatory requirements which is applicable to india and so a professional accountant under this code of ethics uh, is defined as an individual who is a member of the institute of chartered accountants of india and uh, you know the is by term they use the terms professional accountants in business but in with reference to our ca act you know the uh, indian code the our code of ethics we have modified the term to professional accountant in service instead of professional accountants in business so a professional accountant would be a member of the icai moving to the next slide there are some fundamental principles uh, that have been uh, listed out uh, you have integrity as the first uh, fundamental principle where a professional accountant should be straight forward and honest needless to say uh, which all of us are uh, objectivity so when we do any audit any certification any assurance engagement uh it has to be done with full objectivity that is uh, as a professional accountant we must not allow bias or any conflict of interest or any undue influence of others to override professional judgments right so because in the uh, case of any uh, engagement there are professional judgments which are carried out and they uh, should be done with utmost care and there should not be any bias conflict or any influence when we uh, take any professional judgment so that is the objectivity which is a fundamental principle uh also about professional competence and due care that when we are exercising our professional duties we should provide a competent professional service based on the current developments in practice legislation and techniques so typically you know like we say that we have to keep ourselves updated with whatever are the uh, regulatory changes which are there and also we should have competent uh, people executing the uh, assignment to ensure that there is a professional competence and due care taken confidentiality we should respect the confidentiality of information so we should not uh, share any information of the client uh, that uh, we have because we get a lot of information uh, with respect when during the course of our assurance engagements 
and we should respect the confidentiality and we should not share that unless we take a written permission or we get a written permission from the client to share that with uh, somebody else. And professional behavior, definitely we should comply with the relevant laws and regulations and also we should avoid any action that discredits the profession. So these are the five fundamental principles which is applicable to all members, whether in practice or in uh, service. So moving on, friends, we shall now uh, just take an overview about what the conceptual framework uh, uh, approach uh, is to be. So uh, uh, kindly change the slide, please. So friends, there can be different types of threats that can be identified during the course of an engagement. Yeah, uh, Akshay, can you please change the slide, please? Yeah. So there are different type of threats that can be there uh, during the course of execution of an uh, assignment. So first is to identify the threat. So there can be a self-review threat, you know, like uh, where you are reviewing your own work. I'll, I'll just give a very simple example which will come across uh, 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 subsequently also that let us say a chartered accountant is doing the uh, accounting of a client for which they are also the uh, auditors. So that is there is a threat, that is a self-review threat that whatever you are accounting, you are going to audit. So the maker and checker is the same person. You know, we can say that indirectly. So that is a self-review threat. Uh, so you have to identify that threat. You have to evaluate that what is the risk that is associated with that threat, you know, so once you have identified that threat, there can be even a conflict of interest can be a threat that uh, let us say you are auditing the books of account of a business where uh, you are very close relative, maybe your wife or your father, or if, if we have a female member, then your husband is the proprietor of that business and you are auditing that uh, uh, the books of account of that business, then again, there is a conflict of interest uh, thread that is there. So there are different types of threads that have been uh, highlighted. And so you have to identify the threat. You have to evaluate to what extent that threat is there. And then you have to apply the necessary safeguards to overcome that threat. And there can be different safe types of safeguards, again, which have been uh, listed out in this uh, the Code of Ethics, Volume 1, that what can be the different types of threats and how you can, what are the safeguards that you can apply. Now, after you apply those safeguards, then either there would be the a reduction in the threat, so the threat would be reduced, and then you can accept that assignment. But if you're not possible, if it is not possible to reduce the threats, you know, even after applying the safeguards, if it is not possible to review the reduce the threats, then you would have to decline the assignment or exit from the assignment. So this is what is the conceptual framework that uh, is mentioned uh, in the Code of Ethics, Volume One. Moving on to the next slide, friends, uh, there is a pattern for uh, each of these section and how you read it, uh, especially in the revised code of ethics, the 2019 code. So when you go through the, the different chapters, uh, 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 that has been the uh, next slide, please. So when you go through the uh, different chapters, so there would be a, uh, initially an introduction where the subject matter is addressed that whatever is the chapter, the subject matter, and it also introduces the requirements and application material for with in the context of the conceptual framework. So that is what is the introduction. That is the first portion of the particular chapter, wherever it is, each section. And then you have requirements, which is designated by the letter R. And if you see there, uh, when you go through the code, it is uh, the word shall has been now been used instead of should earlier. And uh, so that is the actual requirement of the code of ethics. And then you also have uh, some uh, paragraphs where the letter alphabet A is mentioned. So this is the application material. So this application material, it gives you suggestions, explanation, guidance, illustrations, and other things in how to uh, comply with the requirements. So you have a requirements and then you have an application material, which is a guidance on how the requirements can be satisfied by the member with respect to that particular uh, section. Going on to the next slide, uh, no clar. So like uh, we said, three of the provisions which were uh, uh, deferred uh, earlier from 2020, uh, this has now been made applicable, which is non-compliance with laws and regulations. So presently, uh, as has been notified, this no clar has a very limited application uh, to all the assignments as compared to the assignment. So the ISBAC code says that this no clar should be applicable to all assignments and all employees 
whereas uh, the ICI Code of uh, Ethics, the Volume One, under NOCLAR, it is applicable to only to the listed companies, entities, and having net worth of two fifty crore or more. So two conditions, both have to be satisfied. The entity has to be a listed entity, and its net worth has to be two fifty crore or more. Then only that entity would be covered under this particular NOCLAR. So and for the professional accountant in practice. Uh, as far as these entities are concerned, it will be applicable to only the audit assignments, not to any other assignments, but only to the audit assignments of these entities. And for those professional accountants in service, uh, this NOCLA requirement would be applicable to senior professional accountants in the service of listed entities. So senior professional accountants are typically the KMPs, the key managerial personnel who are at the very senior position. This NOCLA requirement would be applicable only to them and not to the uh, junior uh, level, right? So this is what is with respect to the uh, NOCLAR applicability. Uh, what what is the background? So this NOCLAR, see, uh, normally when we do the audits, we do uh, uh, check, you know, the compliance with the accounting standards, the compliance with the uh, Companies Act of the other, uh, I would say, the uh, financial related uh, laws and all. We do check the compliance with respect to that. And if there is no uh, uh, non-compliance, we do report on it. But here, under this NOCLAR, and why, you know, presently it has been made applicable only to the large listed companies, that is those having a net worth in excess of 250 crores, is because now the reporting is required for any act of omission or commission committed by the client or the employer, contrary to the prevailing laws or regulations. And then, you know, uh, laws and regulations can, in its ambit, can cover anything and everything, not just with respect to the financial laws or any such thing. Now, what are the scope? What are the laws and regulations? So, laws and regulations that have a direct effect on the determination of material amounts and disclosures in the financial statements and other laws and regulations compliance with which may be fundamental to the entity's business and operations or to avoid material penalties. So, you know, we go to the next slide to just go through the illustrative list of what could be the examples of the laws and regulations that are required to be addressed. You know, like you have uh, laws with respect to fraud, corruption, bribery. So that would all these laws would now be covered under NOCLAR, money laundering, terrorist financing and proceeds of crime, securities markets and trading. So if there is any violation, let us say any uh, insider trading or I would say violation of the SEBI preventer, uh, prevention of insider trading regulations then they would get covered under this and the professional accountant in practice as well as in service for the uh, entities, listed entities having net worth in excess of 250 crores, they will also have to report uh, on this uh, particular uh, violation. Uh, other aspects are banking and other financial products and services, data protection, tax and pension liabilities and payments, environmental protection, public health and safety. So these are all the laws where typically there is a chance that uh, you know, these are uh, important for the entities, business and operations, and they can result in material penalties. So uh, not in the scope, material matters clearly inconsequential, so which are small matters or which have no uh, such major consequences, negative uh, impact on the uh, company, they can be, they would be out of the scope. Any personal misconduct unrelated to the business activities of the client or employer that would be out of the scope non compliance other than by client or employer or those charged with governance management or other individuals working for or under the direction of the so uh, if it is a non compliance by anybody outside the organization or that entity then it would be outside the scope of uh, no class a professional accountant is required to address no car only when he encounters the same while providing professional service, right? So you don't have to go and search for non-compliance, but during the course of your audit or provide, providing a professional service, if you come across any non-compliance, then you are required to address the same and uh, disclose, disclose it with the appropriate authority. For example, uh, SEBI uh, in case of fraudulent financial reporting, so depending on what is the non-compliance, you will have to determine who is the appropriate authority to which this non-compliance has to be reported to. Going on to the next slide, friends, breach of independence provision for audit and review engagements. Now, this is something which is very, very important for from a code of ethics perspective, and that is the independence. How independent as a professional accountant you are with respect to your clients. And mechanisms of self correction are prescribed in case of the code. So if there is any violation, if there is any conflict of interest, then the mechanism for self correction 
are there in case as a professional accountant of your own you discover an unintentional violation like for example again i would say that let us say you have got the audit of a listed company or a bank and uh, after accepting the assignment you find out that one of your partners is holding the shares equity shares uh, of that particular client or the uh, uh, bank then you know you have come across this uh, violation which is unintentional because at the time of acceptance you were not aware of any such thing so then there are mechanisms of self correction that are prescribed in the code uh, so like we mentioned earlier the portion part 4a and 4b it covers the steps to be taken in case of breach of the independent standards so 4a is with respect to your audit uh, and review engagements and 4b is with respect to uh, assurance engagements other than the audits and reviews as a professional accountant when you identify the breach you shall evaluate the significance of the breach and also its impact on your ability to comply with the fundamental principles so we saw those five fundamental principles earlier so when you identify the breach you will have to evaluate how it would impact the uh, your compliance with the fundamental principle and as a firm if you conclude that there is a breach of the requirement uh, and you have taken uh, you shall take the prescribed steps that is either you will end suspend or terminate eliminate the interest so if you have a conflict of interest you will try to uh, end that particular conflict but if you are not able to end that conflict or that breach then you will have to consider the applicable legal or regulatory requirement and apply them that means whether you need to withdraw from the assignment or whatever is required for that particular case you will have to examine it but friends let me tell you independence is utmost important it is the foremost uh, uh, requirement for any particular assignment as a professional accountant in practice moving on period of independence again this is a very important provision uh, because many times you know when we talk of independence whether there is a breach of independence or not uh, uh, please change the slide so moving on to uh, you know when we talk of the period of independence one is that when we do the audits when we do the assurance engagements it is for a particular financial year so the code of ethics now the question arises that whether wherever there is a uh, conflict of independence and independence check or whatever we need to uh, however we mention it for what period we need to ensure that that independence is there is it let us say for for example that you are conducting an audit of a client which is for the period from 1st april 2021 to 31st of march 2022 right and i am just taking a very simple example that for that 12 months whether you need to be independent or not uh, please go to the previous slide yeah thanks so uh, what the code says that the independence you will have to keep in mind one for the engagement period and the period covered by the financial statement so now, now let us say for the financial year 21 22 i'm just giving a simple example don't relate it with the provisions of companies act i'm just being that uh, for the financial year 21 22 if you are the auditors your appointment would be made in the agm that is held in 2020 right so september 2020 the agm is held you are appointed as the statutory auditor for for the period uh, september 20 so you, you will be appointed for the period first uh, april 21 to 31st march 22 and your appointment would be valid till the conclusion of the agm where the accounts are adopted so typically if you ask me uh, till september of the uh, 22 uh, so uh, you will be uh, there as the auditor because it is from 1st april 2021 to 31st march 2022 so you will have to remain as an auditor for the engagement period so your engagement period is till the conclusion of the agm right from the conclusion of one agm till the conclusion of the other agm right so for this uh, sorry you will be appointed in the first 30th uh, september 21 agm and you would be uh, ending your term in the september 2022 agm so right so there is a financial year 1st april 21 to 31st march 22 and there is a agm period which is 30th september 21 till 30th september 22 so typically you your period of independence would be from 1st april 21 to 30th september 22 so it is not a 12 month period it would be an 18 month period because your engagement is till the conclusion of the agm 
so the financial statements period plus till your engagement period so that is what is the period of independence that you will have to maintain and what are the safeguards that uh, you need to uh, have subject to provisions of the companies act that using professionals who are not audit team members so we'll come to some of the provisions by which you will be uh, uh, more clear on this having appropriate reviewer to review the audit and the non audit services and engaging another firm to reperform the service. so let us say if there is an independence violation then what are the safeguards that you can put in place one is that i am just giving an example which we would cover subsequently but just for the purpose of clarity uh, let us say there is a provision for taxation that you are supposed to uh, for the client you prepare the computation and the provision for tax and the deferred tax working right now the maker so you are preparing those computations uh, with respect to current tax and deferred tax as an auditor you are reviewing it so you are the maker and you are the checker so there is definitely a conflict with respect to the independence or in a very plain terminology i would say the maker checker uh, which is not permitted under the code of ethics so what the safeguards is one is that the uh, the calculations with respect to the current tax and the deferred tax they are prepared by your team members who are not your audit team members yeah right so you have a separate team which let us say is handling only the taxation related work in your office so they do the calculation of current tax deferred tax that is independent those team that team member uh, is nowhere involved in the audit of that particular client they are just doing the tax uh, calculation and then you have an audit team member who reviews that tax calculation and this person has got no role as far as the calculation of the current tax and deferred tax is concerned so then you are this is how you can put a safeguard with respect to a conflict check that might uh, or a conflict threat that might come up during the process of the audit second is that where you have a reviewer to review the audit and the non audit services so uh, <clears throat> you are having separate reviewer so let us say the uh, computation has been calculation for provision for tax has been done by a person in your uh, team uh, you would have a person uh, who would be reviewing it and maybe there is some connection between the two so above the two you have an appropriate reviewer who will again review the work that has been done by the audit and the non audit service team to ensure that there is a total independence uh, of the uh, review of the calculation that is being done so that is the second type of safeguard that has been mentioned in the code of ethics and the third is that engaging another firm to reperform the services so let us say uh, you don't have that much of segregation of uh, responsibilities or duties you don't have the review levels if if that is the situation and you have the same person who is going to do the review of the calculation and actual calculation in that case another way of how to safeguard the independence is that for that particular calculation you engage another firm who would do an independent calculation with respect to the current tax and the deferred tax numbers and then that they would be validated with respect to the financial statements so these are the different ways in which you can put in or apply the safeguards to ensure that there is there are no threats uh, with respect to independence that uh, come in uh, next slide please friends uh, some of the provisions relating to the independence of auditor so when is where the statutory auditor cannot be the internal auditor simultaneously the internal auditor cannot be the tax auditor simultaneously so these are all uh, embedded in the uh, part 1 uh, of the second schedule the internal auditor cannot be the gst auditor and also there is a uh, cooling of period after completion of tenure as a director so in case any of you are the director of a company then after you complete your term uh, so either completing your term or resigning from the directorship you shall not accept the assignment of audit for a period of 2 years from the date of completion of your tenure as director or resignation or the director of that company so this is the independence requirements that is embedded in the second schedule to the uh, ca act uh, moving on friends there is a, a concept of a key audit partner uh that is there uh so uh, you have different levels of partners so uh, under the code of ethics so a key audit partner which was not mentioned in the 2009 code uh next slide please uh, which is not there in the 2009 code but now in the 2019 code it is defined that uh, the engagement partner is the individual responsible for the engagement quality control review and all other audit partners 
who are on the engagement team to make key decisions or judgments on significant matters they will uh, on which the firm will express on opinion they are the uh, key audit partners so depending on the circumstances and the role of the individuals on the audit other audit partners might include audit partner responsible for significant subsidiaries or divisions also so this is the definition of key audit partner that has now been brought in the uh, code uh, next slide please so uh, friends, the code of ethics also brings in the concept of firm rotation. We already have a firm rotation under the Companies Act that has been now in the 2013 Act. But now there is also the partner rotation, which will coexist along with the firm rotation wherever it is prescribed by this statute. So this is what we have mentioned because under the Companies Act, it also talks of the partner rotation uh, where the uh, members of the company uh, seek a partner's rotation. Uh, in such case, uh, 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 the company would uh, request the audit firm to have the partner's uh, rotation. So under the code, uh, in the next slide, uh, it has been tabulated that what are the requirements of the partner rotation. So we have a seven-year time on. So that remains the same under the 2009 code and uh, uh, 2019 code. But uh, so this is typically applicable to the PI, the public interest entities and uh, uh, partner rotation where under the Companies Act, like I mentioned, it is done on behest of the company only, but where the members, you know, they can prescribe a shorter time period, then that should would prevail. So what are the requirements now under the 219 code that after every five years, the pooling off of an engagement partner is required after every three years, a pooling off of a EQCR, that is Engagement Quality Control Reviewer, that is what has been prescribed. And every two years pulling off for all other key audit partners, this is what has been prescribed now under the 2019 Code of Ethics. Uh, so even the partner rotation is prescribed by certain regulators such as RBI, NBFCs, that would prevail over the Code of Ethics, uh, the partner rotation. Like I said, this is applicable only to the public interest entities. So moving on to the next slide. During the partner rotation, what are the activities which are restricted by those partners who are rotated or who are in the pooling period? So those partners are prohibited from consult on consulting with engagement team, any technical or industry specific issues, transaction or events. So let us say uh, Mr. A is a partner who is under pooling off. Uh, so he may be a engagement partner or engagement quality control reviewer or any other key audit partner in five, three, two year, whatever be the period under that, he is now under pulling off. So he is prohibited, that partner uh, is prohibited from consulting with the engagement team. So the team which is engaged for that particular assignment under which he is having a pulling off, he would not do any consultative activity with them. He would also not lead or coordinate the professional services provided by the firm to that audit client. Malab, not just audit related, but any of the services that partner who is under pulling off period would not be uh, uh, leading or coordinating any services with that particular client. And also there is a prohibition on undertaking any role or activity that would result in the individual having frequent interaction with the that management, that company's management or exerting a direct influence on the outcome of the audit engagement. So these are the activities or prohibitions on during the call, uh, pulling off period. Uh, moving on to management responsibilities. So this is not the management responsibility which we talk in the audit report. This is the management responsibility which as an auditor or as a uh, professional accountant in practice that you are providing to an audit client. So now under the 2000 edition, there is a new section. Uh, this has been introduced with respect to management responsibilities and as per which the firm shall not assume a management responsibility for an audit client. And what do we mean by management responsibility, which means controlling, leading, and directing an entity, including making decisions regarding the acquisition, deployment, and control of human, financial, technological, physical, and tangible, intangible resources. So it's a very, very wide definition. So I would say that, you know, uh, in short, that you need not, you should not provide any services typically uh, under the uh, where you are providing services to an audit client. However, some administrative services are exempted. Uh, you know, advice and recommendation uh, 
without management taking any management responsibility if there are some services that are to be provided that are allowed like some word processing services preparing administrative or statutory forms forms for the client approval submitting forms as instructed by the client and also monitoring statutory filing dates and advising and client on those dates so these are some of the administrative services which as an for an audit client uh, 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 PA, that is a professional accountant, is allowed to undertake. Moving on, friends, on the non-assurance services. So you can see that what we are discussing right now are all, these are all principles because these are typically what is there in the volume one to the code of ethics, that providing non-audit services to audit clients, they might clear threats to compliance and therefore also threats to independence. So most of the prohibitions with respect to the non-audit assurance services are there, which were there in the 2009 code. They continue in the 2019 code. And uh, uh, some of them we will discuss in the subsequent slide. So we move on to the next slide with respect to non-assurance services, which you are which providing to the assurance client. So the first is accounting and bookkeeping services. Uh, can you change the slide, please? So accounting and bookkeeping services, friends, as we all know, it is prohibited by ICI. It is also prohibited by the Cleans Act to the audit. So what constitutes accounting and bookkeeping? That is already uh, mentioned in volume one, but we all know what is accounting and bookkeeping. So accounting and bookkeeping to an assurance client is prohibited. Administrative services, it is provided to audit clients, and now it is part of the management consultancy uh, services. So we discussed about some of the administrative services that in the uh, previous slide, what it covers. Uh, valuation services, again, these are part of the management consultancy services guidelines, where valuation of shares and business and advice regarding amalgamation, merger and acquisition. Uh, it is uh, permitted, but then uh, the volume also prescribes the threats and safeguards in providing the valuation services to your audit client, which you should take cognizance of. Moving to the next slide, internal audit services, it is provide, prohibited by the ICI as well as by the under the Companies Act. So internal audit services, we cannot provide to the uh, assurance clients. Information technology systems, uh, uh, can you move to the next slide, please? When providing the information technology related services, uh, you must in, ensure that uh, Certain things like the client acknowledges its responsibility for establishing and monitoring a system of internal controls, right? So it is the responsibility of the client uh, where uh, they acknowledge that it is their responsibility for establishing and monitoring. You are there just to advise them on that. Ultimately, the establishment and monitoring is their responsibility. Litigation system support, again, there are examples uh, like assisting with documentation management, acting as witness, calculating estimated damages. So these are some of the litigation sub, uh, support systems which are there. So as a PA, a professional accountant, uh, you can take provided safeguards uh, have, are put in place uh, with respect to the amounts that affect the financial statements on which as a firm you will express an opinion. Right. So let us say you are calculating estimated damages, which will form part of your contingent liabilities disclosure. I'm just again uh, uh, taking a hypothetical example. So in that case, like we discussed our, earlier about the um, calculation with respect to current tax and deferred tax. Similarly, here also when you are calculating the estimated damages, uh, you have to ensure that it is either an independent team or it is reviewed at appropriate levels independently or an external firm gets involved in the review of that calculation so that the person calculating and the person reviewing in the financial statements, there is a clear cut uh, uh, independence and proper safeguards are put in place. Yeah, next slide, please. Legal services, again, this might uh, create some self-review or advocacy threats. So self-review, like we said, that the person who is providing the legal service and doing some calculation or taking some views on that, uh, and then as a firm, you yourself are certifying those financial statements. So there are possibilities that there would be a self-review threat and also an advocacy threat where as a chartered accountant, you are advising or something, you are giving uh, some advocacy, uh, uh, I would say, opinion 
on which in future you yourself would be reviewing the uh, computation or calculation of that. So let us uh, hypothetically, again, I'm saying that as a uh, under legal services, you give a view that for a particular uh, unit of the entity, uh, exemption under income tax would be available. Now that is the legal service. That is a, a opinion that you have given. Now as an auditor, when you are reviewing the calculation for current tax and deferred tax, you yourself are again taking the similar view with respect to the exemption. So you have already taken a view with respect to exemption of a unit, which you are following when you are doing the review as a uh, auditor. In that case, there is a self-review as well as an advocacy threat and which you must try to mitigate. And therefore, a partner or employee of the firm, you shall not serve as a general counsel for legal affairs of the audit client. Corporate finance services. So friends, again, we are discussing about the non-assurance services to an assurance client. So the corporate financial services, a firm shall not provide these services to audit client that involve promoting, dealing in, or underwriting the audit client's shares. So if your client is coming out with an IPO or something like that, uh, then you will not provide these services with respect to promoting, dealing, or underwriting in the shares of your client. And also you will not provide any uh, financial advice to your audit client where such advice, it depends on a particular accounting treatment or presentation on the financial statements on which your firm only as an auditor would express an opinion. So you should clearly stay away from such assignments or providing such services. Uh, moving on to the next slide. There are new provisions now on recruiting services that are prescribed in the volume one to the code of ethics. So the description has been enhanced of recruiting services. Clear guidance have been given uh, about what is uh, prohibited. So new provisions, they help avoid assuming management responsibility by providing recruiting services like you have a IT or an internal audit services. Prohibition on providing certain recruiting services now applies to all entities like seeking for or seeking out candidates and also to undertake reference checks for prospective candidates. So these are some of the things because what happens is that when you do a recruiting services, let us say for a CFO or a very uh, a CEO or a very uh, senior level uh, management position, there would be a conflict of interest because the person you are recruiting tomorrow, the same person would be your client with whom you would be interacting with. And so there is might be a uh, threat to the independence. And therefore, uh, there are prohibitions on the recruiting services that can be provided to the audit clients. Friends, on the next slide, we will now discuss about the taxation services to audit clients. So like initially you mentioned, there were three provisions which have now been introduced from 1st October 2022. One is NOCLAR, which we discussed. The second is this, which are now going to discuss the taxation service to the audit clients. And the third, with respect to the relative uh, size of the fees uh, that we will take uh, subsequently. So this has been made effective from 1st October 22 and further guidance on taxation matters has been provided. So generally, again, there should not be a self-review or advocacy threat. So when it comes to preparing uh, the tax return uh, uh, of a particular client, usually there is no threat and you can provide these services to an audit or an assurance client uh, with respect to tax return preparations. Second is where I took the example earlier, tax calculation for the purpose of preparing accounting entries that subsequently your firm only would review. So there is a self-review threat and therefore this would not be permitted unless you apply the three any of the three safeguards to avoid or mitigate the self-review threat that we discussed earlier. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, tax planning or other uh, advisory taxation advisory services. Again, this might create a self-review or a self-advocacy threat. Uh, please change the slide. So this might create a self-review or an advocacy threat and therefore appropriate safeguards. They have to be ad adopted against what we, again, what something we discussed in the uh, past where you use professionals who are not your audit team members. So you have a very separate team, which is doing the tax planning, tax advisory services, and they have no way related in the providing the audit service to the uh, same client. Or you have an appropriate reviewer, or you have an external firm uh, reviewing the work. If you are able to mitigate the threat, which might be a self-review threat or an advocacy threat, uh, then you can provide tax planning or other tax advisory services. Similarly, tax services involving valuations here also, there might be a self-review or advocacy threat and you need to put in appropriate safeguards 
uh, to mitigate that threat. Uh, assistance in the resolution of uh, tax disputes. Uh, again, here, this might create a self-review or advocacy threat, and uh, you have to provide uh, for adequate safeguards. But, uh, uh, you know, this provision would, uh, so not to provide, so safeguards you need not provide if it involves acting as advocate for the audit client before a court. You know, and a court does not include a tribunal or amounts involved are material to the financial statements on which the firm will express an opinion. So you cannot provide uh, such services to uh, the client before, uh, on behalf of the client before a court and which does not include a tribunal or where the material amounts are material. Uh, so these are, these are with respect to the taxation services that you, whether what, to what extent you can provide to the client, you cannot provide. And uh, the third, where you may provide a, provide uh, with sufficient safeguards to ensure that the threats are mitigated. Moving on to the next slide, friends, uh, the safeguards, talking about the safeguards, we have deliberated a lot on the safeguards. So the new revised code, the application of safeguards that are required are such that they either they eliminate the threats altogether or they are reduced to an acceptable level. And what is acceptable level? It is the level uh, reasonable and informed third party knowing facts. So there is a third party who knows that there is a threat, but they would still conclude that the accountant, the auditor complies with the fundamental principle. So any third party who is aware that there is a, let us a self-review threat or an advocacy threat, uh, but still that third party would conclude that in spite of there being a threat, you would, as an accountant, as an auditor, would still comply with the fundamental principles that we discussed earlier. So that is the acceptable level uh, definition. So you can ad address the... Uh, address or eliminate the threats in one of the uh, three methods. So one is eliminate the circumstances creating the threats. So like we said that, you know, if you are, uh, so you find a partner who is holding equity shares of that particular company, then you ask the partner to sell off the shares. So, you know, the circumstances that created the threats, they are eliminated. So there is now no conflict of interest and you have eliminated the circumstances. Second is to apply the safeguards, right? So we have discussed about three types of safeguards where you have a uh, a proper maker checker who are independent of each other. Uh, that are the ways in which you can apply safeguards. Or the third way is to decline or end the service. You do not provide that particular service. So let us say when we talk of the tax calculation, uh, current tax, deferred tax calculation. So you uh, terminate that service. You say that I would not be doing this tax calculation. Let the client do it or client appoint some other uh, person to do that calculation, which you as an auditor would review. So you would decline or end the service. So these are the three ways in which the threats can be addressed. There is a new step back requirement for an overall conclusion uh, now under the uh, revised code where the professional accountant, you shall perform an overall conclusion about whether the actions that the accountant takes or intends to take to address the threats created will eliminate those threats or reduce them to an acceptable level. So you do a step gap, you verify that whatever action you would be taking to address the threats that would eliminate or reduce the threat to an acceptable level. Moving on to the next slide, friends, is about the public interest entity. So we discussed about NOCLAR and uh, other provisions also, which applies to the PI, the public interest entity. So what is a public interest entity? It is defined as either one, a listed entity, or an entity defined by a regulation or legislation as a public interest entity or an entity for which the audit is required by regulation or legislation to be conducted in compliance with the same independence requirements that apply to the audit of entities. So these are the three types of entities which would come under PI, that is the public interest entities. Banks and insurance companies are to be considered as the public interest entities. Other entities might also be considered by the firms to be public interest entities as set out separately. Moving on to the next slide. Inducements including gifts and hospitality. So we had similar provisions in the Code of Ethics 2009. But the code of in the Code of Ethics 2019, Volume 1, the inducements. So it is like gifts that the client gives to the auditor or an uh, assurance or professional accountant. Uh, 
these uh, sections they deal with that so inducements they are now elaborated the definition is more uh, wider now uh, to first see whether prohibited by laws or regulations or first whether that gives hospitality inducement uh, you know that is prohibited by law offering also prohibited uh, you take a reasonable and informed third party test that is to see whether it is with the intent to improperly influence the behavior of the recipient or of other another industry. So when the gifts, the inducements are offered, that is gifts are offered or hospitality is offered, what is the intent? Whether the intent is to influence the behavior of the recipient or any other individual. Uh, there are some clarifications given. It is extended to the professional accountants in service also. And there is a total prohibition in case of audit assurance clients where it was also that was there in the 2009 code also. And now it continues in the 2019 code also. Friends, in the next slide, we discuss about the documentation. So firms are required to document their conclusion with respect to the independence requirements specifically. Right. So these are specific requirements that are required to be documented by the firms. So in the 2019 code, the requirements of documentation, they are, are now given in greater details and you need to document. So when you are addressing any safeguard to address a th threat, uh, you shall document the nature of the threat and the safeguard in place that have been applied, right? So that has to be documented. Like we took an example that one of the uh, partners is holding equity shares. So there was a threat. Now you need to document that that the partner has sold off that uh, those particular equity shares and now there is no longer any conflict with respect to independence uh, in that client. And when a threat requires significant analysis and the firm concluded that the threat was already at an acceptable level, you shall document the nature of the threat and the rationale for the conclusion and also documentation relating to no class. So friends, these are some very important documentation requirement that we need to maintain under the code of ethics and uh, they would help because many times uh, we have seen that at a subsequent date, there are some questions that are raised on the independence of the auditor with respect to certain uh, assurance clients. And these uh, documentation uh, that are maintained, they would help uh, in the uh, case. Peace. So this is the third provision that we were discussing and uh, something which is uh, would be uh, applicable to many of the uh, forms. So one is that this provision has been made effective on 1st of October 22. What it says is that where for two consecutive years, where the total gross annual professional fees from the audit client and its related entities represent more than 40% in case of non-PI and 20% in case of PI. So for a firm, I'm just giving an a for a firm, let us say the total gross annual professional fees is 25 lakhs. Now the fees from an audit client and its related entities, right? Let us say that is uh, 20 lakhs. So this is definitely more than 40%. So 40% of 25 lakhs is 10 lakhs. And in this case, the fees is 20 lakhs. So it is in excess of the threshold limit of 40% that is prescribed. And in case of PI, the requirement is 20%. Uh, so where the uh, total gross annual professional fees and its related entities is more than 20% in case of PI, then so earlier the provisions, they were 15% and there was no bifurcation between PI and non-PI uh, clients. But now this relaxation has been brought about where now 40% in case of non-PI and 20% in case of PI of the total fees received by the firm, then the firm shall disclose this matter to the institute. Earlier, the provision was that the firm was required to disclose this matter to those charged with governance. That is, in the entity, the client, the audit client, you had to disclose this, this to the, let us say, the audit committee or the board or typically those charged with governance, uh, stating their, their fees as a proportion of your total fees as an auditor is in excess of the prescribed threshold. But now the disclosure has to be made to the institute and the thresholds has also been uh, revised. Again, earlier the requirement was that in case the threshold is breached, then a quality control review before issuing a third year's financial statements had to be done. And after the third year final are issued, have the second year's financial statements review. So these uh, provisions have now been eliminated. No such reviews are required to be done. There are certain exceptions. So first is 
that where the total form of the fees is less than 20 lakhs, which earlier was 5 lakhs, which had been prescribed, but now where the total fees is less than 20 lakhs per annum, then this provision would not apply. And also in case of audit of the government companies, which is used, the nationalized banks, public financial institution, regulator, or where appointment is made by the government. In such cases, the uh, these provisions of checking the threshold would not apply, right? So these are with respect to the relative size uh, for the fees. Moving on to the next slide, with respect to overdue fees, and there is a possibility that a self-interest threat is created if fees is outstanding even at the time of issue of the next year's op audit opinion because it would then become equivalent to a loan. So, for example, let us say that uh, there is an audit client for which uh, the auditor is conducting audit for March 23. Now, the March 22 fees of, let us say, 5 lakhs of rupees, they are still outstanding as at March 23. Then the what the code of ethics says is that now the fees is outstanding. So it is as if the auditor has given the loan of five lakhs to that particular client because these are the undisputed fees which are provided for which the client has not yet paid and they are outstanding as at the balance sheet. So there is a credit balance lying there. So it is equivalent to a loan. And therefore, the you know that the auditor's independence uh, might be uh, questioned because the auditor may feel that this 5 lakhs is outstanding and therefore there can be a self-interest because there is an interest of the auditor in that client's business that it remains profitable uh, so that he is able to recover his fees of the earlier year and therefore there is a possibility of a self-interest threat and a appropriate review mechanism should be built, built in in such cases. Indebtedness. So there was no concept, uh, going to the next slide, yeah, uh, there was no concept of materiality in the 2005 and 9 ISBA code, but 2018 it introduces a concept of materiality uh, for the of the loans and guarantees. So in our code also of 2019, uh, we have mentioned this and in such case presently the limit as per the Council's general guidelines of 2008 is uh, to the extent of 1 lakh rupees or whatever has been specified in the uh, law that means in the Companies Act or whichever law the appointment is made, what is the indebtedness that is permitted the threshold that has been prescribed in the law. So there are some important uh, decisions uh, which uh, are there, which I have covered in the next slide with respect to the indebtedness. So the council decided that auditor, uh, next slide please. So auditor for the purpose of indebtedness, it should not it will not include internal auditor concurrent auditor or any auditor giving report to the management it would cover uh, only typically a stat auditor like we use in the gen general parlance uh, indebtedness would also include loan taken by a member against fixed deposit or any security and it includes loan like car loan home loan etc and especially in case of the this is applicable in case of the uh, bank audits and uh, you, uh, the member is not uh, permitted to accept the audit assignment where he has taken loan beyond the existing indebtedness limit of uh, 1 lakh. On credit card, there is no prohibition on holding the credit card, but where the chartered accountant is the auditor of the bank, the indebtedness of 1 lakh would apply if there is an outstanding balance beyond the prescribed credit period given to the holder of the credit card. So it would become like a loan and indebtedness if it is beyond the prescribed credit period. And a form of charter accountants cannot accept branch audit of the bank if one of the partners has taken loan from any branch of that bank, right? So you have been given allotment of a particular branch of a bank, but any other branch, somebody or a partner has taken loan, then you cannot accept that particular uh, audit assignment. Moving on to the next slide. Engagement in other business or profession for a CA in practice. So, uh, friends, as a chartered accountant in practice, you shall be deemed to be guilty of misconduct if you engage in any business or profession other than that of the chartered accountant unless permitted by the uh, council. So, director, simpliciter, or independent director is allowed. So, where you have not involved in the affairs except for attending board meetings or activities relating to board meetings, you can be appointed as a director, simpliciter, or independent director. Uh, and a director simplicity, it means an ordinary simple director who is not 
MD or whole time director and you are required only in the board meetings and not paid any remuneration except for the board meeting, attending the board meeting, the remunerations that you are paying. So there is no equivalent of a director simplicitor in LLP. So this is for companies, the private limited limited companies. For LLPs, there is nothing, there is no equivalent of a director simplicitor. So you cannot become a partner or a designated partner, maybe non-working, maybe non-remuneration drawing in an LLP, not carrying out professional work. So if you have any family business of LLP, which is not doing any professional work, you cannot be appointed as a partner or a designated partner in such LLPs. Moving on to the next slide. There is a general permission given. This is an illustrative list to the CA regulations uh, appendix. Uh, so employment with CA from what activities you can, as a chartered accountant in practice, you can uh, undertake. So you can take undertake employment with CA firm, private tutorship, author of books, articles, holding public offices like MLA, MP. So this is a full list. I'll not uh, spend much time on that. You can go through it. And uh, like it has been put that this presentation would be available on the Nagpur branch website. So you can pick up from there and uh, keep it for your uh, easy reference for a special permission. If you want to be a lecturer in university or college, uh, then you have to take a special permission, but where the, the total direct teaching hours, it should not exceed 25 hours in a week. And to take editorship of uh, other uh, editorship other than professional journals or managing director, whole time director of company with no interest, you will have to take special permission of the council. Moving on to the next uh, slide. Or CA in practice who have the part-time COP or part-time in practice, which we say, again, these are the general exemptions that have been given and also the specific uh, exemptions that are there. So I will not again dwell in detail, but here I will mention one thing which is mentioned in bold is that a member who is deemed to be in part-time in practice is not allowed, is not entitled to perform a test function and also not be entitled to train article assistance. So part-time COP, you cannot do any certification, you cannot generate UDIN, and you cannot also train article assistance. Moving on, friends, about uh, a CA in practice and uh, HUF. So the position in the revised code. So you can be a Karta, you can be a HUF. Uh, so it must result. So first of all, it must result from inheritance, succession, partition of the family uh, business. Only after specific and prior approval of the council, a Karta cannot have active role and attest functions not permitted. So the clarification that has been incorporated is a member engaged as Karta or HUF doing family business will be within the prescribed lim uh, limit prescribed by council if he makes investments from the funds pertaining to HUF only, provided he is not actively engaged in the management of the said business. So only with respect to investment of funds pertaining to the HUF, where you are as the Karta, you can uh, carry out those activities. But if you are having some business in the HUF and you are managing that business, that is not permitted by the uh, code of ethics or by the uh, uh, regulations. Uh, moving on, friends, sharing of freeps or profits. Uh, as a chartered accountant, you shall be guilty of misconduct if directly or indirectly you agree to pay or allow any share, commission, or brokerage in the fees, profits of your professional business to any person other than a member of the institute or a partner, retired partner, legal representative of deceased partner, any member of any other professional body or such other persons having qualification as may be prescribed. So you can share fees, remuneration, or commission brokerage only with these categories of persons. So a member, your partner, a retired partner, legal rep of deceased partner, member of any professional body as uh, notified by the ICI. So that is as far as sharing, giving is concerned. Clause 3 talks about receiving share of profits from a non-CA. So you cannot... Uh, agree or accept any part of the profits of a professional work from a person who is not a member of the ICI. Uh, again, the exemption being with respect to clause two. So if any of the persons of clause two uh, gives you any share of their profits, then it is permitted. But other than that, it is not permitted. Uh, again, moving on to the next slide, where we talked about uh, any member of any other professional bodies, the professional bodies prescribed are uh, the company secretary institutes, uh, cost and works accountant institute, bar council, architects, actuaries, uh, 
So this is the list prescribed qualifications. This is the list. So sharing of fees or profits, so either giving or receiving to these category of persons is allowed under our code of ethics. Uh, there is no bar in sharing of fees if stipulated by any uh, statute. Like you have the Maharashtra Cooperative Society Act, where you know twenty percent of fees was payable to government. So you know the, it does not get covered under these categories. But there is a exclusion. You can uh, share fees if it is stipulated by the uh, statute. Referral fees amongst members has now been permitted under the commentary to clause three. So this is with respect to sharing of fees or profits. In the next slide, we will discuss about entering into partnership. So, uh, friends, you can uh, enter into partnership uh, with persons other than CS into partner. So, what, what we have typically as the multidisciplinary partnership, which we are all aware of. Uh, yeah, uh, please move to the next slide. Uh, so, friends, in that, uh, we have made amendments. The ICI has made amendments to its regulations. But MDPs cannot be allowed till the regulators of other professional bodies also allow uh, with respect to the uh, multidisciplinary partnership where they can. So sharing of fees or profits like we saw earlier, that is permitted, but the multidisciplinary partnership till the other institutions or other professional bodies also come out with their set of regulations. Uh, this multiple multidisciplinary partnership presently is not uh, allowed. The uh, next uh, slide on the tendering guidelines, friends. Again, this is a... Uh, area where we need to uh, take utmost care, uh, like tendering for services areas which are exclusively for CS, they should not be responded unless some minimum fees has been prescribed. So that is the first requirement under the tendering guidelines. So if it is only for CS, the minimum fees should be prescribed in the tender. If it is open to other professionals also along with CS, as chartered accountants, you can respond to such tenders. You can bid for such uh, work. If it is open to CS and other professional, but the tender document specify that only CS should apply, such tenders can also be responded. Assignments where quotations have been called for from practicing member firms to individual letters can also be responded. You can respond to tenders where initially only a technical bid is called for and where subsequently member the firms or members from whom the technical bid is called for, they are shortlisted. And after they are shortlisted, Financial quotations are sent only to those firms. If this is the process, tendering process that is being followed, you can still uh, attend to it. You can still respond to it. And the ICI, they can call for any papers, documents relating to bid submitted by members. So it is with respect to bid, not only even if you do not get the work, but you have bid for any particular tender, then the ICI can call for any papers or documents uh, that you have submitted in response to a particular tender. Moving on to the next slide, uh, with respect to professional stationery and visiting cards, you can mention ICI diploma uh, degrees that you hold, like you have the DISA, you have the DIRM and uh, other diploma courses that are there. Uh, you can mention that on your visiting card, but as far as the certificate courses are concerned, which uh, a member would have passed that exam, but still the uh, qualification with respect to the certificate course that cannot be mentioned on your visiting card or your professional stationery. Uh, you cannot use the terms like president of so-and-so club or any such thing uh, with in your professional stationery visiting card. Uh, member of parliament, municipal councillor, though as a chartered accountant, you can uh, uh, become a member of parliament or a MLA or councillor, but you are not allowed to mention that on your stationery. Vision, mission statements or catchwords are not allowed. Adjectives like ITAT lawyer, finance consultant, that should not be mentioned. However, IP and registered valuer is permissible. So you can mention along with CA, uh, if you have uh, insolvency professional or registered valuer, it is permissible. You cannot mention the date of setting up of your practice uh, or the date of establishment of your firm on professional stationery. When you are practicing, in addition to a chartered accountant, if you are practicing as an advocate, company secretary, or cost accountant, you cannot use both the designations at the same time. Uh, you can use only one designation at a time. The use of designation chartered accountant allowed only on professional documents. Other places, prefix CA can be used. When you are directors in companies, member of political parties, or CA cells in political parties holding different positions, you are not permitted to use mention these positions as they would be violative of the act. 
and mentioning qualifications of foreign accounting institute where ICI has MRA or MOU. Uh, where, and you have got these qualifications of that professional accounting, foreign accounting institute, you can mention that uh, uh, qualification. Moving on to the next slide, with respect to solicitation of, of uh, professional work, some aspect uh, association with network as a medium of referral is now permissible only if the network is registered with the ICI and such networks are permitted only if the network uh, partners or the network uh, components comprise only of the CAs or CA firms and they are governed by the network guidelines. Uh, it is not permissible for members to list themselves with online application service-based provider. Right, So uh, you have some of these service-based apps uh, where there are a host of services that are mentioned that are there and they are all service provider aggregators where you have businessmen, technicians, you know, like you have the plumbers, electricians, maintenance workers, event organizers, all are listed. And on such service provider aggregator applications, online applications, a chartered accountant, you are not permitted to list yourself. You can upload educational uh, videos. However, no reference should be made to the CF form where you might be a proprietor or a partner. So you can mention your name, but you cannot mention the name of the firm. You may apply, appear on television, films, internet, and agree to broadcast in the radio, radio or give lectures and forums. Everything is permitted, but you have to mention yourself only as chartered accountants. You can give special qualifications also or any specialized knowledge on the subject matter that you may have. Firm name may also be mentioned. However, no exaggerations, right? That this is the best firm or this is the uh, top firm or any such thing uh, that is not uh, permitted. And what you may say or write must not be promoting yourself or the firm. Uh, it must have the objective uh, professional view of the topic. So, you know, whatever, let us say, I, I'll give a very simple example that many of our members, uh, and I would say very proudly that they are invited to various TV channels, especially after the budget is announced, you know, on the views and also that is the, uh, so you have to give a view on the topic with respect to the union budget and all, and you have to restrict yourself to that. Uh, you cannot promote yourself or your firm using that particular platform. So that's just uh, an example that I wanted to share. Even on the TV or the movie credits as a firm or your member's name, it is permitted. But again, it should not be mentioned differently from other person. We have seen that in the after at the end of the movie when the name scroll of everybody, the chartered accountant firm is also uh, mentioned over there. But... Uh, it should not be that it is in a different font or it is given in a box. It should not be mentioned differently from other persons who are getting recognition in that TV or the movie credits. Uh, next slide. These are some of the important guidelines or announcements of the ICI. Uh, so you have the advertisement guidelines amended. You have the general council guidelines. You have uh, website guidelines, CA logo, tender. So these are all there. Uh, they have now been included in volume two. So like I mentioned, friends, earlier, volume one is principle-based, volume two is rule-based, and these are the rules that uh, is uh, mentioned as far as the uh, volume two is now concerned. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, this is one of the latest uh, advisories that the ICAI has given on the with respect to the social media. Uh, so a form of CA, you may have an account on social networking websites, where it may mention its name, the firm's name or other contents as per the uh, what is permitted under the advertisement guidelines that is issued by the uh, institute, right? So uh, you are permitted to have an account on the social networking websites. As a member, so that was with respect to a firm. As a member in practice, also you may have an account on social networking website where you may represent yourself as a proprietor or partner in the firm. But again, the content of the website shall be as per the advertisement guidelines. Now, the firm or the member may give the link of his website or web page on the uh, social networking website. So you might have your own website, your own web page also. So on the social networking site, you can give link of your website or your web page. A member who is maintaining an account on the social networking website in his personal capacity, right? So. Besides personal nature contest, your following may also be mentioned on the website. So videos of educational nature may be uploaded on the internet by members subject to compliance with the code of ethics. 
you may also post contents which help the profession grow in the perception of the world contributes towards enhancement of its reputation expert knowledge in the respective specialization helps solve problems and also promote learning and idea sharing so all this is permitted on your social networking uh, website you can use the prefix ca also with your name on the social networking website but at the same time as members you are expected to exercise professional discretion and utmost dignity while using the designation chartered accountant or the prefix in your personal account uh, or social networking website for posting contents comments uh, that have been mentioned above right so you have to take care that ultimately that word ca is a very powerful word it has a lot of responsibility with it attached with it so whatever you post on the social media you should ensure that you exercise professional discretion with and utmost dignity with respect to when you are using anything with that word chartered accountant or the ca moving on to the next slide with respect to appointment of uh, auditors so friends uh, you know many times what i have seen uh, is that uh, when uh, there is a change of auditor that is happening or uh, a professional accountant a member gets appointment as an auditor and especially of a com uh, of a company they are uh, you know so happy when they get the assignment that they forget to do a, do a proper due diligence now the uh, the law what it the code requires that whether as a, a member as a member in the institute you will have to ensure that the provisions of companies act are properly complied with when you are being appointed as the auditor so what are the provisions or what you have to see as part of your documentation uh, one is that you have to ensure that the notice for the general meeting Uh, where you are been appointed as the auditor was properly served on the members and outgoing auditor so that is the first documentation requirement uh, that you have to check or i would even go a step forward that you might have to keep as part of your appointment uh, documentation uh, second is obtaining copy of the minutes duly verified and signed by the chairman and proper appointment letter so you should have the minutes of those meetings which are signed by the chairman Uh, of the meeting that should also be on your record where you are appointed as the auditor and third is the proper proper appointment letter ensuring that it is from proper authority so if you ask me typically i would uh, say that they have to be signed by a director maybe the chairman managing director or a director rather than some other uh, a person like an accountant or anybody there has to be the appointment letter has to be signed uh, from by the proper authority so you will have to ensure a proper company law compliance when you are being appointed as the auditor moving on to the next slide once you are appointed as the auditor communication with the previous auditor is extremely extremely important and friends we are aware that there are many cases which are available in disciplinary cases which are available in the public domain uh, next slide please where the communication with previous auditor was not done uh, before accepting the assignment so this is applicable so the communication has to be in writing with the previous auditor that is mandatory it is applicable to all types of audits uh, the requirements so it is applicable to a, i would say a concurrent audit a stock audit a definitely statutory audit tax audit uh, so any audits or any such certifications uh, the uh, communication with previous auditor is mandatory second is that it is the position held by a ca held previously by a ca and not previous your ca so let us say hypothetically you get an appointment of a tax audit for march 23 let us again for march 22 and for march 21 the entity was not under tax audit and no tax audit had been done for march uh, 20 a tax audit had been done by some other firm so march 20 some other firm had done audit 21 22 there were no audits and now uh, there was no tax audits required and 23 you are being appointed so you have to communicate with the auditor who had done the tax audit for march 20 though for march 21 and 22 the audit was not required so it is the position previously held by a ca and not previous year ca so this you have to keep in mind uh, when you are uh, accepting a new assignment and the communication with the previous auditor has to be made before you accept the audit right so this is something which you have to ensure that before you accept the audit you have to communicate with the previous auditor 
And in case of government audits and bank audits, when you have to start the work immediately, you, know, you have to accept and start the work immediately. There, the uh, guidance clearly uh, promote, uh, mentions that uh, you can uh, give a conditional acceptance where you can say that this uh, uh, that I accept this assignment uh, subject to the clearance from the uh, pre preceding auditor or the previous auditor. So that condition acceptance you can give it is permitted. And we all know what is the objective that you as an incoming auditor, you may have an opportunity to know the reasons for the change in order to be able to safeguard your own interest. Right? This is the reason for communicating with the previous auditor. So what are the modes of communication which I have given in the next slide? So presently there are three modes which are acceptable. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So communication by letter uh, by RPAD, that is the registered post acknowledgement due. That is the first uh, mode of communication. Second is by hand against a written acknowledgement. Uh, so, you know, if it's in the same city, you can you hand deliver, but at least in typically what we say in the OC, the office copy, you need to take a written acknowledgement that they have received that communication uh, uh, from uh, the new auditor. Third is acknowledgement of the communication from via email, right? So you send an email uh, communication to the previous auditor. So the email address can be that which is registered with the institute or last known official email address with which the uh, previous auditor might be communicating with the client. So these are the three modes that are presently permitted. Uh, and in case, so the response, you have to wait for a reasonable time for a response to come. Uh, so uh, there is nothing like uh, uh, 10 days, 15 days, one month that is specified, but uh, you there has to be a reasonable time that you can wait. And in case till that time you do not receive uh, as an incoming auditor, any communication from the previous auditor as a response to your communication, you can accept the assignment. Uh, there is a fourth method through UDIN, which the council is working upon, and separate guidelines would be issued once this gets activated on the UDIN portal. Moving on to the next slide, outstanding undisputed audit fee. Again, friends, this is uh, under the code of ethics, uh, where... Uh, as an incoming auditor, you will not accept the appointment as auditor where the undisputed audit fees of the previous auditor uh, have not yet been paid, right? So there are exceptions uh, with respect to a sick unit that the above prohibition shall not apply. Now, what is the uh, meaning of undisputed audit fee? So whatever is the provision for audit fee in the accounts, that has been, let us say, March 22, now, March 22 accounts, whatever is the provision for audit fees that have been provided and that those have been uh, signed by both the auditor and the auditee, that would be considered as the undisputed audit fees. Therefore, I would say as a uh, professional brother that please ensure that your audit fees are adequately provided for in the financial statements that you sign off as an auditor. And SIC unit, which means unit registered for not less than five years when net worth is negative at the end of the year. So this is these are this is the exception exception and the definition of the undisputed audit fees. So you cannot accept any assignment where the audit fees of previous auditor is uh, undisputed fees of previous auditor is unpaid. Moving on to the next slide, contingent fees. So uh, friends, you cannot. As an auditor, as a professional, I would say as a charter accountant in practice, uh, charge, accept, or offer to accept in respect of any engagement which are based on a percentage of profits or which are contingent upon findings or results of such uh, things except as permitted. So you cannot say that my audit fees would be, let us say, 2% of your net profits or, or, or half percent of your turnover or 1% of your net worth or any such thing. Uh, you cannot uh, quote fees or you cannot uh, charge or uh, fees as per uh, as a percentage of uh, uh, profits or which are contingent upon the findings or results of uh, the work that you get. There are certain exceptions to this under Regulation uh, 192, where you are a receiver, receiver liquidator-based realization of assets, value or basis value. So all these are the list which you can uh, refer to, where you in these cases you are allowed to accept uh, fees as a percentage of the uh, activity or work or whatever it uh, is. Uh, moving on to the next slide, friends. Now there are a few FAQs 
but what I believe there would be a lot of questions that members would have. So, uh, uh, Akshay uh, Jitubai, if you permit, uh, I can, you have all these on the website, you can put it up, I can skip this, and uh, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, have some uh, question answer session uh, with the uh, members because I could find there were a few questions that has been put up and right. uh, for positive of time, I would not like to uh, skip them. Uh, sure, maybe sir. you can just uh, go to the uh, uh, last slide. You can put an end uh, to and a previous last time, what I mean to say. Uh, friends, another thing I would just like to share is that uh, uh, in 2020, when I was the vice chairman at the WIRC, we had come out with this concept of uh, having a video on the code of ethics, the FAQs. You know, I, I believe a lot of you would now be interested, refresh, ho gaya hoga aapka, uh, code of ethics related. Maybe some of you might have referred to or studied it last time when we appeared for our CA exams. But now, you know, if there is a uh, curiosity to go through some of these provisions, these FAQs, uh, they are in an audiovisual form. Uh, which you can uh, download. So it a uh, three to four minute video of each month we used to come out with. And uh, uh, they have, uh, so there are 12 videos. It will not take you more than one year, uh, one uh, hour, sorry, not one year, but one hour to go through those videos. And you can, uh, that is available on my website. You can see it right at the bottom of this slide, vishaldoshi.in. So that is available uh, over there. You go to log on to the website and there is a portion of uh, VI log VILOG in that all the 12 videos are there. You can download them and you can view them. And just uh, Akshay, if you can go to the previous slide, a page of Kardo, sir. Yeah, so this is another uh, thing which I do, uh, VI share, uh, where I carry out, uh, bring out with various tools and uh, knowledge sharing snippets and all. I do a broadcast. In case you are interested, friends, uh, you can save this number 85118319881. You can just drop in a hi to me so that I can add to your to I add your number to my broadcast list and you can get the knowledge sharing uh, uh, tools, templates, images, and all that I share on a regular basis. Well, friends, thanks for uh, a very, very patient listening. And I'm happy to see that there are still almost uh, 400 people who are there uh, at the end of the session also. So uh, uh, Nagpur branch, I take back my words that the participants were not there for the CP. They were there to actually listen to the provisions of the code of ethics. Thank you. And we can now go to the Q&A session. You can stop sharing now, uh, Akshay. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, definitely, as you rightly said, the members are not here for just for CP. Uh, we can understand this with a lot of queries there in the chat box. Uh, friends, uh, if you have any further query, kindly share it in the chat box. We will, uh, Vishal sir, will try to uh, uh, take all the questions. Uh, sir, one of the question is, uh, if a person has joined board as independent director, but involved himself in purchase function of the company, and also signs the annual financial statements for the company as a board member, will he be acting in contravention of the code of ethics? Should I repeat the question, sir? If a person has joined board, yeah, so just a... we will have to learn the sign language also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> if a person has joined board as independent director but involved himself in purchase function of the company and also signs the annual financial statements for the company as a board member, will he be acting in contravention of the code of ethics? So two things, uh, what I understand, one is signing the financial statements. So that you are signing as the uh, board is authorizing you to sign on behalf of the board. So you are signing those financial statements which are deliberated, discussed in the board meeting and you are authorized as one of the persons to sign. So you can definitely do that. That would not be a violation. Second, what I understand is involving in the purchase process. So there I feel that, yes, that is that would definitely be violative. So one thing is that where, you know, there is a purchase policy, which you are reviewing the policy as a board member, you know, just the policy and the guidelines which are there. Uh, then it, in my view, that would still be fine because that you are doing as part in your capacity as a board member. 
but involving yourself in the whole purchase process, I think that would be involving the company's uh, operations and uh, would be uh, violative of the code. Okay. Uh, sir, next question might be uh, applicable to a lot of uh, members. If the previous year fees is outstanding because of the financial problem of the client, yet if the member does the current year audit, in this case, is a member guilty? So, see, one thing I will tell again, uh, some members see here, so I'll take that liberty uh, to share over here. Ke what happens is uh, the financial problems of the client is what the clients tell you. Ka kya hota hai? And I'll be very, very frank. Uh, I know I'm, I'm very friendly with Nagpur branch. So, uh, we uh, do the collection, ke liye phone karte, puchte hai, aap kaise ho, family, mein kaise hai? Business kaisa chal raha hai. And now right. these are all wrong questions. Jaisa puch to business kaisa chal raha hai. Usko pata hai, wo bol de gaare, wo ek dam kharaab chal raha hai, ye hai, wo hai. And then that thing start. And then you are stuck. Here. You can't ask the fourth question ke paisa kab de raha ho. You know, fees ka kab payment kar raha ho. So this is typical, <laughs> which I say in the lighter way. But uh, see, the whole thing is that to what extent the fees are outstanding. Second is that what is the amount uh, of the fees uh, you know, because whether it is something that would impact your independence, that is the see the whole code of ethics. If you read, ultimately, it says that whether you are able to function as an independent professional accountant or not. So all the threats, ultimately, if you see, it boils down to that. So let us say, hypothetically, if that fees is 50,000 rupees and your in comparison to your overall audit fees or your overall practice, that is an insignificant amount. So... What happens is that in that case, you, you might say that I don't care about those fees, but I'll give a true and fair view. It would not impact my independence. So you have to see from that perspective and uh, maybe you will have documentation. Uh, I'm saying in terms of the fees of that client, in terms of the overall fees and all, which you would justify that though it was outstanding, but it has not impacted your independence or there is no uh, any threat that has been created before of that outstanding. But I would say the other way around that uh, if possible, you can just share this particular provision with that client and say that, you know, I actually, because of the fees outstanding, I cannot start your next year's audit. So I, would I mean, look, request you to do the other way around. Right. But sir, in case a, any member has done that, uh, will he be guilty? Then it would not be, like I said, you will have to justify that your, it has not impaired your independence typically. Right. Right. So next question is, can a member in practice form or run a religious trust or organization? No. Because, see, I'll, I'll tell you the background behind all these provisions. Again, I'll go to the uh, concept and then you can start applying the various provisions. That what the institute wants is that when you are in practice, your full focus should be on your practice. Right? Because uh, like the uh, our, uh, ICA president has said that audit is a serious business. And similarly, when you are holding a certificate of practice, you should do a proper compliance. You should totally get to be focused on uh, such things. So if you are, again, everything you would uh, evolve around that, that if you become a trustee of a religious trust and, you know, the whole time you are supposed to be uh, appearing over there as a trustee and involving yourself in the day-to-day -day operations, then there would definitely be some impact on the uh practice that you might be you would be carrying on and therefore in such situations it is always better to avoid those things okay uh, sir next question might be uh, relevant to a lot of uh, young members uh, can a member create his own youtube or other social media channel for providing knowledge regarding education social or political or religious matters Yes, so uh, like I said, the recent announcement, announcement of the ICI on the use of social media, you can have your YouTube channel. Uh, you can also use the uh, word CA uh, uh, before that, provided again, you have to ensure that whatever content is being carried out, it's already listed in that particular uh, advisory that the Institute has given in that advisory that you can uh, do with respect to sharing the knowledge or promoting the institute, the activities of the institute, and uh, all those things. So provided you do that, you do not bring any, uh, I would say, anything detrimental to the profession or the word CA, you can definitely have that. Okay. Uh, sir, along with this, uh, the related question is, uh, there are a lot of uh, CA member directories uh, by private organization as well as the branches of ICEI. 
so can a ca member give his ad of the form in the directory so uh, outside the no the ca form cannot give advert because it is the, the advertisement guidelines which should be covering and second i remember uh, earlier we used to have the yellow pages you know in the directory jab wo hum log telephone use karte the main kab right. tak ki baat kar raha hu right sir. so even the ici has come out with the guidelines that in the yellow pages you can and give but it is not an advertisement that you can give you can give just the ca name address and what was was permitted in that particular uh, slot that is what is uh, permitted in the yellow pages advisory and otherwise also the advertisement guidelines would apply where you cannot give the advertisement of your form or your service okay uh, sir next question is uh, as a tax auditor if uh, the client does not comply with the gst uh, act and denied the payment of gst under reverse charge what a tax auditor can do i think this question is related to income tax audit only so it has they they have not done a gst compliance gst compliance right sir so i presume see as a tax auditor you would also be uh, i presume it's a non corporate entity uh, so where you are doing the tax auditor and you would also be giving an opinion on the true and fair view of the financial statements so in that case if it impacts the true and fair view where the provision has not been done or any such thing is there it should form part of your opinion uh, where you depending on the uh, materiality and the other uh, aspects uh, covered in the standards on audit the ss 700 series again i would request you to refer to if whether you need to give a qualification or disclaimer of opinion or a uh, a uh, uh, modification uh you know that you have to uh, see and then you will have to give it in your audit report accordingly uh whether a member in practice as a sole proprietor can also join a ca partnership firm and simultaneously continue as a partner and if yes then yes. can he have only a sole proprietorship firm board outside his office premises not a partnership board so for uh, see what i as far as i remember that the boards to be mentioned outside i don't think so the guidelines say that if you are having boards what type of boards you should have the guidelines do not say that you must have a board right so the board typically you must have a board that would be governed by the uh, local regulations you know if you have a municipal corporation if they want some boards that if there is a business or a commercial enterprise uh, then you must have a board outside and that would be governed by those provisions so first is yes you can be a proprietor you can own proprietorship firm as well as be a partner in another ca firm yes you can uh, giving the boards outside your office the ici guidelines do not uh, require to have a board but if you have a board then you have to follow the uh, use of the signage and everything that has been prescribed by the ici right so uh, so next question is can a member in practice use any other designation on social media like tax expert or business developer or entrepreneur like that no no okay. but can he put a ca prefix before his name on the social yes, media? ca prefix like i said in the recent advisory that has been allowed you can use the uh, prefix ca okay. uh, so next question is if we get the confirmation of i suppose previous auditor must be uh, on the email regarding the acceptance of stock audit uh whether it will be sufficient communication yes so uh, like i said uh, especially during the covid this email communication has been uh, made uh, uh, as a norm normal uh, mode of communication by the council uh, because at that time we were having lockdowns and there were no physical movements and all that were happening so that has been introduced which is still continues now so you can communicate with the previous auditor on email and you can even receive uh, the reply or the confirmation from the uh, previous auditor uh, via email right sir sir this question might interest a lot of members what is the recourse if the previous auditor does not confirm and how to yeah. solve this problem so like i mentioned what the guidelines say is that a reasonable you have to wait for a reasonable time right but again i had mentioned that the reasonable time is not defined so you can if you ask me i would say say that uh, on, from the date of receipt of the communication by the previous auditor so if it is a hand delivery the date when you have delivered that if it is by rpad the date when the rpad would have been delivered to the previous auditor or the email has been delivered so from that day if you ask me my personal view again is that 15 days is a reasonable time 
for the uh, reply uh, to be received uh, before accepting the assignment. But you can have, if you want, on a safer side, you can even wait for 20 days, 21 days, whatever. But the guidelines, it says that you, there has to be a reasonable time given for response. Uh, sir, next question is, uh, whether in case of trust audit under Bombay Public Trust uh, requires to comply with the communication to pass auditor. Uh, also, uh, on the last year trust audit report, nowhere the email ID was mentioned and neither the uh, details of previous auditor were uh, given by the client or the manager. So what we should do in this case? Yeah, so uh, see, typically uh, how I would look at it is that as far as the trust audit is concerned, communicating with the previous auditor is required, right? So like we say, even in case of bank audits, where it is the appointment the banks do, the guidelines provide that you have to communicate with the previous auditor. So even in case of the trust under the Bombay Public Trust Act uh, audit, the communication with previous auditor is required. So that is the first answer. Uh, second is that uh, what can happen is that the previous auditor, you can take the uh, email ID or the contact details or the membership number uh, from the uh, the trust or the society from whom uh, uh, you know uh, audit karne wale ho, the audit team uh, who was the previous auditor or even take a copy of the uh, audit report of the last year which typically I would understand most of us would be doing that uh, with, in which the auditor's name and details are uh, mentioned in that and uh, uh, if the MRN is there membership number is there uh, we have the ICI uh, website where trace a member uh, page is there where you give the MRN and the capture and the details of the member with the address and all gets uh, displayed. So you can use that as an alternate also, uh, or like I said, with the oddity, you can communicate and ask them for the uh, email ID and the address of the previous auditor. Uh, sir, next question is, in some cases, CAs are charging monthly fee from their audit client for doing all kind of work, like including GST returns, ITR, uh, etc. So uh, is it permissible? So see, uh, like I said, so I'll, I'll, is it permissible from an assumption point of view? I'll talk of two things, whether services are permissible and whether that fee charging is permissible. <laughs> so I'll, I'll break it up into two things, uh, just for the clarity of members. Uh, one is that, uh, as far as the services are concerned, we discussed that return filing, uh, tax return preparation is permitted uh, uh, service that is there. So uh, because GST, TDS, all those would be monthly services with respect to the return filing. So that is permitted, right? So that is the first thing. Second thing is that you invoice on a, a monthly basis based on the services that you have provided. So you have provided services as per the agreed terms. Uh, you are now raising an invoice for which you are you will be receiving the payment, right? So there is there is no indebtedness uh, uh, between you and your client because you have already rendered the service and now you are raising the invoice. So that is also very much permitted. Uh, so next question is, uh, NOC has to be obtained from previous auditor is confirmed. But in case the company has obtained NOC unnamed, as to whom it may concern. Not a lot. Not a lot. Okay. Okay. See, so, because the uh, see the code of ethics applies to chartered accountants. It does not apply to the company. Right. So you can't take a, 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 have an NOC like something like to whomsoever it may concern. You know, typically that is what I understand. The correct. Question was. Correct. That was so the... that that is not permitted because see, first is your communication with the previous auditor. So even if you get a to whomsoever it may concern, you have not communicated. Okay. That is what the court requires and therefore your communication with the previous auditor is necessary. Uh, can CA holding COP work abroad in a CA firm? Do a test function in the capacity of partner of the CA firm registered in India? I don't think that, uh, so let us, I'm again taking a situation where uh, uh, a COP holder, a partner in a firm, let us say, goes to a foreign country. Foreign country, because you see, the foreign country, the laws of that country should permit a ICAI member to certify the financial statements under the Act and regulations of that country. 
So as far as my knowledge goes, that is not permitted because nowadays you must be seeing a, a lot on the media that it is with the, uh, uh, I think the UK and Canada that now we have said the reciprocity would start. You know, we have just given that uh, proposal to the government to take it forward on the FTA. The, uh, uh, so I, I believe that uh, presently uh, that is not permitted where a CA cannot sign. Actually, in my view, the, he or she cannot sign the financial statements in a foreign jurisdiction under the foreign laws. Uh, no, the query was, sir, uh, he is holding COP, but working outside India. Can he do the attest function in India on behalf of the CA firm registered in India? Uh, again, I would say under the standards on audit, that would not be permitted because ultimately when you are signing, you have to review the financial statements. You have to document your review. You have to document and carry out all the compliances with it are required under the standards on audit as the reviewing or the signing engagement partner. These are the words that I use, the engagement partner. So if you are sitting abroad, if you are able to demonstrate that you have conducted the engagement review uh, as an engagement partner and complied with all the standards on audit, you may still sign. But again, you when you sign, the place of your signing, you have to ensure you can't write Nagpur when you are sitting in America. Right, right. <laughs> so in my view, that should not be uh, permissible because I, I don't see any way in which the standards and audit can be complied with sitting there. Right. So, so next question, I think you have already uh, uh, answered, but uh, can a COP holder form a HUF? Uh, yeah, just a minute. Can a yes. COP holder form a HUF? Yeah, so I already covered, there was one slide yeah. on that. Yes, sir. That yeah. uh, HUF, you can you know, do the investment activities in the HUF where you are a karta, but you cannot undertake any business activity or any other things. Uh, so next question is, as a karta of HUF, can we take the salary from that HUF? In my view, no. Because uh, again, like I said, that if you are doing just the investment activities as a karta and there are no business activities, then uh, salary and all, because the salary would mean that you are involving yourself in right. managing the business on a regular basis or a full-time basis or whatever. And that itself would violate the provisions. Um, can CA do LLB course simultaneously with practicing full-time CA profession? Yes, you can do Okay. Okay. Um, so after again, qualifying, I, otherwise, one one two ka ha, nahi, after qualifying. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Uh, sir, I think you have answered this question again. I'm taking can a CA advertise on Suleka or India Mart? The same thing which I said that we had these uh, guidelines earlier. So, advertisement guidelines, uh, you can check what you can give uh, on those uh, things. Right. Can a CA firm forward the festival greetings in social media? with services they provide? In my view, no. Okay. But without services, can we promote that, sir? Yes, you can. Okay. Right. Can we mention on the later head that if uh, the revert is not received within seven days, that we presume to be confirmed? I think this is regarding the uh, NOC, information. Communication yeah, NOC. with the previous auditor. Right, sir. Communicate. Yes, you can. But see, what happens is that one... Where we say is a positive confirmation, one what we say is a negative confirmation. So right. this typically, uh, when you say that if you don't receive a reply in seven days, it is deemed uh, that you have no objection or whatever. It is like a negative confirmation, which uh, typically is not advisable. You always have to go for a positive uh, confirmation. And I would, like I say that these guidelines itself, they provide for a reasonable period. So if you believe seven days, 10 days is a reasonable of some of the uh, previous auditor or the outgoing auditor is a local person in your city only and you feel seven days is a reasonable time, then you can definitely uh, accept it. Right. Uh, sir, a CA firm is carrying out 50, 60 stock audits on a regular basis. So uh, the communication with previous auditor of those 50, 60 stock audit, is it mandatory? This is the question. Yeah. It is very difficult to uh, understand so the auditors. 
Yeah, so if you if you see the, the FAQs which uh, we uh, skipped for paucity of time and to take this Q&A, it is clearly mentioned that concurrent audit, internal audit, stock audits in all communication with the previous auditor is required. Is it? Uh, sir, if there is only interest income from the uh, own HUF, is it allowed? Interest income? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, a client, not a company or LLP, uh, insists to do all the work under one roof along with the accounting to auditing and IT return file. But since we are prohibit prohibited to provide the accounting services, what is the solution to return accounts and audit also? So practical question. Hey, again, again, uh, uh, going back, so I'll take this uh, uh, example that has been given. So it's the same office, what I understand. Audit services be ho rahi hai, accounting services be ho rahi hai. So first and foremost, the important thing for us as a safeguard is that the person who is doing the accounting work, right? So if you ask me first, the accounting book keeping itself is prohibited. Aap same office mein karo, bahar ki office mein karo, kahi pe bhi karo, by the same uh, form, accounting bookkeeping itself is prohibited. So that is a fundamental thing we have to keep in mind. And that itself would be violative. So I don't think there is any excuse. Now I take a hypothetical situation that there is some other firm or some other entity uh, or an accountant who is otherwise not associated with my firm. He is uh, sitting in my office and doing accounting for a client. So that person, so you have to demonstrate the independence. That means that person that uh, who is doing the accounting is nowhere related or gets involved in the audit process. So that independence has to be mentioned. And if you ask me, it is very difficult to maintain or demonstrate such independence and therefore this should be avoided, the accounting work of an audit client because it is prohibited by the ICI guidelines itself. So even if it is not a company, I know uh, not a company, so companies like provisions would not apply, but even the ICI, the council guidelines prohibits it and therefore it should not be undertaken. Uh, sir, I will take the last question because there are a lot of queries. I request members, uh, you have uh, Vishal sir's number. Uh, we can directly communicate or you can communicate through Nagpur branch as well. Uh, we will definitely forward it to Vishal sir and uh, I understand uh, Vishal sir will definitely will be happy to answer all the queries. The last query is, can a current statutory auditor represent before the commissioner appeals for the client for past years? And a, a related query is whether the commissioner appeal can be considered as a court or only a tribunal will be regarded to as a court. So, uh, see the exemption is very clearly mentioned that uh, commissioner, so uh, where it says court, uh, it would be uh, tribunal. Uh, so I would look at it first, the issue I will address, then the technicalities. Uh, so for past assessment years, you are representing a matter for your client, right? Now, let us say, so there are, again, I would uh, visualize two situations, friends. Uh, one is uh, the uh, matter under consideration, the issue under consideration is a repetitive issue, right? So which would um, happen every year and that would make forming part of your uh, financial statements or the other is that it is a one-time issue, but it is under litigation but it would still be disclosed somewhere as a provision or a contingent liability in the financial statements. So typically these are the two situations, but in both the situations, if there is anything that is going to impact the numbers in the financial statements by way of a provision or by way of a current tax or by way of a, a contingent liability, uh, there would be a advocacy threat uh, involved because when I am representing, I would be taking a particular view that this is allowed, this is not allowed, whatever, as a consultant, as an advisor to the client representing the case. And then when I wear the robe of the auditor, because I have already a shirt that I'm wearing where I've taken a view that this particular expense is admissible under the law, though the department might have uh, uh, disallowed it, 
But in this case, because I already have that shirt, even if I wear the robe, that shirt is still there. And therefore, it would impact the independence or the advocacy threat. And therefore, in such cases, that is where the uh, it says that uh, depending again on the materiality and all those aspects, that uh, there would be an advocacy threat and that should be avoided. And like you have the safeguards, let us say that the uh, you have some other partner, let us say, who is your tax partner who is representing in the appeals uh, before the commissioner appeals for those matters. And though that tax partner is nowhere involved in the audit process. So when it comes to the audit process and you make an assessment of the assessment orders which are passed, as an auditor, you will, when you are reviewing, you will take an independent re uh, view of the facts of the case that are laid before you as per the assessment order and as per the prevailing tax laws. And you might create a provision. So you might be, the client might be in litigation, but as an independent uh, auditor, you would still say that a provision is required. In that case, there you are uh, safeguarding with respect to the threats that get, might get created, the advocacy threat and the self review threat. Right. Thank you so much, Vishal sir. Sir, one last question uh, in the interest of members related to administrative uh, point, uh, whether action against the member in practice for violating code of ethics is taken by ICA, Suomoto, or only after receiving a complaint from someone? So, uh, there are two ways. One is uh, so when the complaint is filed, yes, that is definitely there. Second is the information cases. That is what it provides, that when there is any information that is available in public domain or any such thing, uh, which uh, the uh, disciplinary directorate they come across and they feel that this is a matter on which uh, the information is available and uh, it can be subjected to disciplinary action, then information cases are also taken up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vishal, sir. Uh, I, I understand, uh, friends, the queries are never ending, but still Vishal, sir, is there, Nakhtu branch is there. You always uh, uh, send any question. We will definitely try to resolve that. And Vishal, sir, as you rightly said, there are still more than 300 members present here. So it was your persona as well as the topic which uh, uh, engaged the members. Uh, we recognize uh, the past chairman of Nakhtu branch and the past vice chairman of WRCC, Anurut Shenwai, sir, is also here. Uh, thank Anurut, you all the members. Namaskar, sir. Thank you all the members for uh, joining in such a large number. Thank you, Vishal, sir, for always considering Nagpur branch as your own and uh, supporting us. Thank you, one and all. Always. Just, just a moment, Akshay. Uh, yeah. I just wish to remind members that kindly log in in the DLH and uh, please attend the MCQs. Also, uh, put, put across the feedback form, uh, take the feedback form and confirm your feedbacks uh, so that your CP credits would be seamless. Uh, I hope this program was wonderful one and we look forward to have you in the other programs as well. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Vishal, sir, uh, for, for uh, the wonderful deliberation. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And you can upload the PPT. You have it with you. You can upload it so that members can sure. go through the FAQs and all. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank we are you. signing off. Thank you, Vanan. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take Bye, care. Sir. Good night. Good night.